Eric Holmberg has produced a controversial video on rock music. It's called Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll. Rock and roll has been much in the news lately. Certain states have been considering legislation that would ban certain lyrics, possibly even ban rock and roll altogether. You see, rock and roll has been blamed in a number and even named in some lawsuits. Blame for teenage drug addiction, crime, an assortment of problems. All of this has been linked to rock and roll music. Eric, besides the fact that it ruins your hearing and it's often too loud, what really are the dangers behind rock and roll music? Well, Bob, music, any music really, has an incredible ability to affect the listener's value system. And rock has unprecedented power in this regard because of its pervasiveness and popularity, particularly among the most vulnerable of all listeners young people who are still forming their views on morality, religion, all the important issues of life. And on these issues, the values taught by the rock industry are often highly questionable. Let's come back to these values that you're talking about in just a few moments, but as a parent, I'd like to know about this influence that you say this music has. It's true that a lot of young people listen to music, and I suppose that rock and roll is probably the form that they listen to the most, but can't this just be viewed as a harmless pastime? Well, yes, and so can reading a book. You see, it all depends on what type of book you're reading. Bob, how would you feel if you came home and found your children browsing through some pornography or reading an instruction manual on the occult? You see, it's these types of materials they get when they listen to much of rock and roll. Let's look at a brief section from part one of Hell's Bells where we more fully develop this concept of music's power. Hanson is an Oscar-winning composer, by the way. That may be, but isn't it still a little bit incredible to say that uh, this kind of music can affect someone as profoundly as drugs? Well, Bob, no more than saying that TV commercials can influence viewers to buy brand X instead of brand Y. Why do companies spend billions on advertising if it doesn't work? Ideas have consequences, and there is much evidence to suggest that musical ideas have the greatest consequence of all. But advertisers are kind of, in a sense anyway, conspiring to sell a product, Eric. Surely you're not suggesting that musicians and record companies are conspiring to produce juvenile delinquents. No, not at all. But with a few possible exceptions, I believe the artists are being used by either outside forces they don't understand or acknowledge. Let's go back to part one of Hell's Bells. Those are just four examples. The video has many others. Well, who or what is then influencing these artists? Well, biblically, there are only two possibilities because there's only two spiritual kingdoms from which influence or inspiration can flow, God's or Satan's. There's overwhelming evidence, as we'll see, that points to the latter. I know this is a difficult concept for many people to grasp, and we don't have time to adequately develop it here. But again, let's look at a segment from the video. Eric, these are pretty serious charges you're making against the rock music industry. Do you really excuse think me, that Excuse me, Bob, there's... excuse me, but I prefer about the rock music industry. I'm not against them. Scripture teaches that our enemy is not other people, but spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. In other words, the invisible forces of Satan's kingdom. Still, what evidence do you have that demons are involved in rock and roll music? Well, again, there isn't time to do justice to your question as adequately as our video, but consider this. Most people would have no problem believing that demons are influencing Satanists, people who openly reject God and embrace either Satan or Satanic philosophy. Now, I have here the Satanic Bible, written by Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan. This is what he has to say about, about the most primary Christian symbol, the cross. Behold the crucifix. What does it symbolize? Pallid incompetence hanging on a tree. Bob, the same demonic philosophy can be found throughout the rock music industry. Here's just a few examples taken from Hell's Bells. Believable. It's legal to produce that kind of music and sell it to young people? Yep. You know, surely this type of blatancy must be rare. Well, not really. Coven's song may be a little exceptional, though I can cite dozens of others that are just as blasphemous. And by the way, this may help to explain why Last year on college campuses, the Satanic Bible outsold the Holy Bible 10 to 1. But some of the biggest stars in the industry blaspheme God in ways that may be more subtle, but are just as damnable. For example, Madonna told both Spin and Cosmopolitan magazines that crucifixes are sexy because there's a naked man on them. 
One would be hard pressed to find a more sacrilegious comment. And this from a person who polls show to be one of the most influential women in the world relative to young people. Eric, you mentioned earlier that rock music taught what I believe you termed questionable values. Sacrilege, obviously, is one of the things you're talking about, but what, what are some of the others? Well, how about a blatant disregard for life and property? They say it's only rock and roll. Eric, on this issue of violence, there's a lot of talk about satanic-oriented crime. They say it's on the increase and that it's often tied into rock and roll music, particularly the heavy metal kind. Do you, do you have an opinion on this? Well, there's no question about it, Bob, although I think we need to be careful that we don't make rock and roll music the boogeyman in all this. It can't by itself turn someone into an axe-wielding devil worshiper. But in that it does overall preach the most elementary tenet of satanic religion. That is to live for yourself, for your pleasure, whatever you can get out of life. And in, and in that it can also serve as an excellent primer on the occult. Certain brands of rock can become a contributing factor in pushing an already disturbed person over the edge. Some good examples of this would be, in 1985, a 14-year-old boy killed three people. A fan of the popular heavy metal group Iron Maiden his involvement in the occult led him to carve the number for Satan into his chest. He claimed to have been following the orders of Iron Maiden's mascot, Eddie, when he committed the murders. The now infamous mass murderer, Richard Ramirez, alias the Night Stalker, was reportedly led into his obsession with the occult and ritual murder through groups like ACDC. A schoolmate reported that it was their song, Night Prowler, that particularly seemed to affect Ramirez. On their record cover for Highway to Hell, the album in which Night Prowler appears, the singer wears a pentagram around his neck. The most common of satanic symbols, it became Ramirez's calling card, appearing on the walls of his victim's homes and sometimes on the victim himself. 1987 saw the capture of the serial murderer, occultist, and apparent cannibal Gary Hednick. Time magazine noted that from his house in Philadelphia where the crimes were committed, heavy metal music blared day and night. Those are horrible stories, Eric. It's hard to believe that human beings can be capable of such things, but aren't these pretty much isolated incidents? I mean, it's not like there's an epidemic of satanic murders or anything like that in our country. Well, Bob, there's some police officers who would disagree with you. But anyway, these individuals may be just the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands, if not millions of others who have periodical emotional problems and who are filling their minds and hearts with the exact same type of ideas rooted in the same kinds of music. What happens if tough times come in the form of, of an economic depression or even a collapse like some are predicting? And what's really inside of all of this gets put to the test? How many other Ramirez's or Hednicks are going to surface? I see your point, Eric. Let's change gears slightly right now and talk about the growing problem of teenage suicide. I want to read from a newspaper article 16-year-old or a 15-year-old boy jumped to his death, committed suicide, and this is what the newspaper article said. To whom it might concern, I'm tired of life, I'm tired of school, I'm tired of this world, I really don't belong to this world. I wouldn't mind if someone would write to the Scorpions and tell them that their number one fan has left. Tell them that I've flown to the rainbow. Eric, who are the Scorpions? Well, they're a heavy metal group who have an album entitled Fly to the Rainbow. Would you say that they were in some way responsible for this young man's death? Directly, no. But like many groups in rock and the vast majority in heavy metal, they present to their fans a worldview rooted in hopelessness, despair, mindless violence, and anti-Christian fantasy. In this, they have helped develop a mindset conducive to suicide while undermining the one that is the best defense against it. Well, what about this? Two 15-year-old boys shot themselves, and this is what the police spokesman says. And I quote the police report. Rock music may have played a role in their deaths because a tape recorder was found next to their bodies. It appears at this time it was tied to heavy metal, the police officer said. There was a Led Zeppelin tape in the tape recorder that had played itself out. An excellent choice of words. I fear there's many more for whom the tape is also playing itself out. The cries of the 60s and the 70s was sex, drugs, and rock and roll.
Let's talk about Rock's relationship to both sex and drugs, beginning with the latter, if you don't mind. I have here what critics consider probably the most influential album in rock music history. Of course, you remember the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band. Many people believe that uh, through its influence, it wasn't only musical, but the example of the songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, initials LSD, the Beatles opened the way for widespread experimentation with drugs. What do you think about that? Well, there's no doubt about that's true, although the story of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds being a code phrase for LSD is probably not true. But the Beatles, along with Jefferson Airplane, the Stones, the Grateful Dead, the Doors, many other groups, used lyrics, music, album artwork, and most importantly, their lifestyles to turn drug abuse into an acceptable and even preferable practice. I was embarrassed to ask this next question. It's probably the most loaded question I've ever asked, but I, I have to ask it anyway. What types of sexual values do you think are being taught by the rock music industry today? Well, let's just say that young people today are finding a lot more than just their freedom on Blueberry Hill. You know, Bob, as incredible as the intensity is with which contemporary music promotes sexual morality, what's even more incredible to me is the naivete with which our culture views this. And can we honestly think that we can take young, impressionable people bombard them day and night with movies, television shows, and music that promotes a promiscuous lifestyle, and then not see them become promiscuous. Now, I'm not suggesting that we try to pass laws to determine what's suitable to sing about. That will never work. But parents and young people alike can begin to, in the words of Scripture, arise from their slumber and strengthen the things that remain. Ideas, like bullets, have consequences. And there is more than one way to blow someone away. We've looked at Rock's relationship with drugs and sex. Let's turn our attention now to more spiritual things. Eric, I'm going to read an excerpt from Rock Magic, a work by the underground writer William S. Burroughs, and I'd like you to comment. This is taken, by the way, from Hammer of the Gods, the biography of the supergroup Led Zeppelin. Here's what it says. A rock concert is, in fact, a rite involving the evocation and transmutation of energy. Rock stars may be compared to priests, the Led Zeppelin show depends heavily on volume, repetition, and drums. It bears some resemblance to the trance music found in Morocco, which is magical in origin and purpose, that is, concerned with the evocation and control of spiritual forces. In the Led Zeppelin concert, the result aimed at would seem to be the creation of energy in the performers and the audience. For such magic to succeed, it must tap the sources of magical energy, and this can be dangerous. Burroughs is 100% right, Bob, except for saying that it can be dangerous. It's always dangerous. Most of these artists and practically, practically all of the fans have no idea how deadly these so-called magical forces really are. For the vast majority, it's all just a goof. Demonic symbols, occult tools, and satanic songs become, they hope, nothing more than a roller coaster ride to the suburbs of hell. Do you think that the singer or the audience really thinks that they're going to burn in fire? Of course not. And that's what's so disturbing. In scripture, Satan is known as the deceiver. And there probably isn't a greater form of deception anywhere than to joke about hell when one is a breath away from its fires. Can you give me some, or one or two examples anyway, of some of the more subtle forms that occult influences can take? I mean, I just can't believe most young people listen to songs like the one we just heard. Well, again, I wish we had more time to do justice to your question, Bob. We spent almost an hour in the video, Hell's Bells, documenting the occult elements within rock music, covering everything from satanic symbols, ritual, personalities, and the issue of backmasking. But let's take a moment and consider one ob observation made by Burroughs in the piece you just read. He noted Led Zeppelin's similarities to the trance music of Morocco. In actuality, much of rock and roll can be traced to the best known of all forms of trance music, voodoo. They say it's only rock and roll. Music industry insiders know better. With over $10 billion a year of income at stake, the rock music industry targets young people with a sophisticated marketing plan worth millions. Your teenagers are up for grabs. Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll is a provocative expose on two VHS cassettes that openly tells the inside story of rock and roll. 
parents and teenagers alike can view this three-hour documentary covering the spiritual realities behind the lure of rock music with the analysis of dozens of today's rock groups and the behind-the-scenes interviews. The musicians themselves tell you there's more to their music than just a good time. To order your copy of Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll, for only $49.95, call 1-800-822-8500. Visa and MasterCard accepted. What would you say to the average young person who only listens to the more moderate, the middle-of-the-road stuff? Is Hell's Bells ringing for them as well? Well, Bob, first, much of the music that people view as middle of the road is only moderate in comparison to the extremes. But God's standard of comparison is His Word, and by that standard, the vast majority of even soft rock music is at best empty, and at worst, even deadly. I think that a lot of the reason why people fail to see this truth is because they have a caricature of hell and Satan in their minds. Hell, we think, is only for what we humans would consider really bad people, you know, people like Hitler. And following the devil would involve sacrificing babies, drinking blood, or something else equally horrible or weird. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Let's look at a section of part five of Hell's Bells where we develop this idea a bit further. So Eric, what you're really saying is that it doesn't matter whether you're into heavy metal, soft rock, or any other kind of music. That's right, Bob. They all have their satanic elements. The real question we need to ask is, who is our Redeemer? That will automatically determine the type of music from which you draw your life. In our interview, you've drawn a lot of biblical inferences. Can you give me one scripture that would sum everything up? Well, how about these words by the Apostle Paul? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. If someone would be interested in more information or that perhaps they'd like to get a copy of Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll, what could they do? Well, they can make a free phone call by dialing 1-800-822-8500. Thanks for being here tonight, Eric. Thank you. And that winds up interview for this edition. Bob, how would you feel if you came home and found your children browsing through some pornography? 